Hey everyone, thanks for joining us on our coverage of the Linux Foundation Open Source Summit here in Austin, Texas, right at the JW Marriott Hotel. We'll be streaming live through the day. We have a bunch of different speakers lined up to talk to us. I should mention from the outset before we introduce our first get, guest, is today is, um, what do they call it, Dave? It's not zero day, but it's... it's uh, co-located events. Co-located events day, where so the main open source summit actually starts tomorrow. Today there are a number of co-located events, though, that have kicked off. Uh, the Open Source Security Foundation, I know, is mm -hmm. one. FinOps mm -hmm. is another one. There's two or three others that I don't recall right now. Do you? I don't. No. <laughs> There's others as well. So yeah. a lot of people in hall. It's a little quiet where we are here which is pretty cool. Um, but there's a lot of people in the various rooms listening to some amazing content. With that said, though, let me introduce you to our first guest here this week. Their name is Ava Black. Hey, and we had a little conversation off, off camera. I should have uh, just clue you in. You know, sometimes I still mess up the they pronouns. And, and so Ava's promised to help me. Um, so if I mess up, she'll correct us. And, and hopefully us. they'll correct <laughs> us. Excuse me. There we go. First yep. one. And uh, we're doing the best we can with it. Anyway, Ava, that was a lot of preamble. Tell people a little bit about yourself. Uh, well, today I work at Microsoft in the office of the CTO. Uh, I've been doing open source contributions and community leadership for about 23 years now. Uh, so I also sit on a couple different boards. I got elected to the board of the Open Source Initiative last year uh, and the OpenSSF TAC, which is part of why I'm here today at the OpenSSF Day mm -hmm. uh, earlier this year. For people who aren't familiar with TAC? Uh, sorry, Technical Advisory Committee. So we're sort of, uh, we're not the governing board, right. but the OpenSSF Technical Advisory Committee guides, supports uh, the technical projects in the OpenSSF. So it's, it's not the board of directors governing board that are making sort of, if we want to call it business decisions. It's really the, the technical advisory where, where we, you know, what it's at, at a much more technical level of what I'd doing. say the two, go, the two go hand in hand. The board mm -hmm. makes the business decisions around finance and events and marketing, and the TAC makes the technical uh, decisions around what projects become part of the OpenSSF, how projects are governed, what the structure, uh, sort of the, the templates for projects should become. Absolutely. And I want to delve more into the OpenSSF, and especially from a technical <laughs> point of view, some of the things that they're involved in, some of the other things that you're involved in around that. But before we do that, I wanted to come back to this side and, and talk about your keynoting tomorrow. I am. And uh, not to let you know the cat out of the bag, but um, I, I wanted to have you talk a little bit about it. And before Ava does, though, I want to remind you all that in addition to the live in-person uh, aspect of this event, it is virtual. So if you're watching us on TechStrong TV or Facebook or LinkedIn or DevOps like on Security Boulevard, whatever, wherever you're watching this, there's still time for you to register and tune into Ava's keynote tomorrow, uh, as well as the whole week where it is a full roster of some great, great uh, sessions you can check out. So check that out at Linux Foundation Open Source Summit. But Ava. Go ahead. Without giving too much away, um, I'm, I'm really excited to give the opening keynote tomorrow on uh, community, codes of conduct, inclusivity, how to build sustainable, diverse communities, really. Um, and it's, it's a bit of a, of a short one. It's just going to be about five or six minutes. Uh, kick off the morning with that content. Uh, part of the backstory is that we're in Texas, and Texas has been passing some rather, uh, I'd say, some, some laws or some things that are not in accordance with our values around diversity. So I'm going to talk about that and what we can all do to make our community as more inclusive. And then a longer uh, discussion I have on Thursday on code of conduct, uh, not as a tool of punishment, but as a tool of restoration and support for communities on Thursday afternoon. I love it. Look, as someone who lives in Florida, who am I to say anything? <laughs> I mean, quite frankly, we, we've got our own issues. but. I don't even want to get into it. Um, 
but you know, but let, let's talk a little bit about the code of con. So th- th- in my mind here, there's two aspects. Number one is, look, we struggle at TechStrong, right? We, we run DevOps.com, Security Boulevard, <laughs> Container <laughs> Journal, TechStrong TV, uh, Digital CXO, so more than several brands. And we, we are challenged around diversity, mm-hmm. right? Uh, finding speakers. Mm-hmm. You know, we, we do a lot of webinars. We do a lot of video panels. And if you couldn't tell, I'm a, I'm a white male, right? So when I host something, we already got one white guy on the table here. Mm-hmm. I need, to, we are constantly looking for diversity. Mm-hmm. And quite frankly, it, it's a challenge, right? Especially as we go deeper technically, mm. it, it's like there's an inverse law there, right? Where my, my, my pool becomes smaller. And, and so we're always looking right always mm-hmm. trying to find yeah you know uh, people who will represent a more diverse community when we do these kinds of video events but i don't think we're alone right it, it's not just tech strong it's not just my company no, everyone's working on this yeah. and everyone should be working on this um not it's not a pipeline problem there's no shortage of, of women and non-binary people who want to work in tech. We have to make our communities welcoming for them to stay. Yeah. I, I think you hit a, a nail on the head there. And, and let me just mention, it's not just non-binary or even women. It's people of color. Absolutely. Uh, yep. You know, we, we do something down home in Florida. There's a, a school that opened near us called Boca Code. Mm-hmm. where they teach people to be full-stack full developers. Mm-hmm. And we, uh, we sponsor a scholarship called Engineering the Change. We're mm-hmm. actually doing a whole, TV, not TV, video series on it. This, but we've been doing it for two years. And we, and we look for people who, you know, underrepresented communities. Right, right. And um, even there it's hard. I mean, quite, quite frankly, getting people to apply, and, you know, it's a 12-week intense class. A lot of people don't want to put the... Or don't have the privilege, right, to to dedicate 12 weeks, the the financial uh, investment of that, as well as the time away from family or child care, whatever it might be. We've seen it firsthand. Don't have that. No, it's a hard hard push. So, you know, so that's one aspect, right, is just finding the right people. But then there's the second piece of it, and I think you touched on it, which is how do you keep them? How do you nourish them? How do you nurture how do you build a community yeah. of practice in open source? Because that's what we're here to talk about is open source. Yep. Um, how do you build that in a way that uh, such a diverse community feels continually welcome? And when there are crises, when there are incidents, toes get stepped on, accidents happen. Uh, my experience working in, in consent incident response for about seven years now, 95% of the time it's an accident. But you still have to work at it. People still have to recognize the harm they did cause, make amends, learn, do better. And that's how we make communities safer. We also do need to identify the few percent of people that are just being, being malicious. And it's, it's a real challenge. The few people that are trying to do harm. So. I don't want to focus on them because they are a really, really small it's, minority. It really is, yeah. I, I think the problem is when that small minority runs into public policy. Like, are all those people elected officials, <laughs> unfortunately? I don't know what the f- I don't know. thing goes on. I don't know. But, um, I mean, for, for those out there who, you know, maybe deal with this issue, with, without giving that minority more than their due, do you just ignore them? Do you somehow try to cut them out like you excise a tumor? That's an analogy. Um, <laughs> the, the one I like to talk about is called a, the, the analogy of a broken stair, right? We can't just ignore when there's someone in a community who's actively harming any minority in that group. Um, what happens when we do ignore that is the folks who are in the community for a long time know, oh yeah, just, just don't work with that person. We know that they just, I don't know, always try and get always try and do X, or they're always kind of bad, just ignore them. But new people come in, especially from underrepresented backgrounds, and don't know that yet, and get caught. They trip on the broken stair. And so for that reason, we need groups like a Code of Conduct Committee, 
uh, which I was on in Kubernetes for a while, mm -hmm. to identify these, these situations, reach out to that person, offer to work with them to address this, not just automatically you know, excise the tumor, but offer to support them, assuming good intention from the beginning. And if they then demonstrate a lack of good intention, then and only then push them out. I'm sorry. So I want to talk a little bit about open source, though. And, and yeah. you know, look, I, I've been involved in open source software on the security side 20, a long time, 25 years, something same, like that. Yeah. Same, yeah, 99 for me is when I got in. Yeah, I, you know, with Snort and Nessus <laughs> and Nmap. But anyway, yep. um, but the nice thing about the open source community is I've always felt there was a much more welcoming yeah. big tent kind of community mm. as opposed to, you know, maybe some others. So, I mean, with all due respect, I think it's almost easier to do these codes of conduct kind of enforcement or, you know, enforcement seems like you have a stick. But, you know, putting out that, right, stewardship, great word, in the Linux Foundation. Yeah. It's much harder when we go to, like, in security at the RSA show Ooh. or Black Hat or yeah. DEF CON. Well, it's not impossible in those no, situations. No, it's not. I have a lot of friends who and are non-binary. We can look at some of the InfoSec conferences that have done a really good job and some that have tripped multiple times. There's a, a, a recent incident with one of the B-sides that's all over Twitter the past couple days. I'm not going to point attention to it more than that. Mm -hmm. um, but we can see examples of good and bad. That is. And, and kind of what... It surprised me with the one you're talking about. <laughs> Look, I was at the very first B-Size Las Vegas a oh. long time ago. You beat me there. <laughs> oh, yeah, I was there the first time when they did it. Cool. I was at the first B-Size San Francisco. I love that event. Um, I was a Wrangler one year for B-Size Vegas, too. Anyway, not to, I'd sponsor Wrangler. Mm -hmm. I was, but the whole B-Size movement, much like Linux Foundation, mm -hmm. was a very inclusive movement yes. from the get-go. Jack, Jack Daniels and the team did a great yeah. job. Yeah. Um, it, it bummed me out a little bit to see that that happen in a yeah. B-Sides. Yeah, bummed me out a lot too. I've, I've had a lot of trust with the B-Sides community and I know they're sort of um, syndicated or and, franchised. And you don't want, right, and you don't but, want to make blanket, yeah. you know, kinds of things. But as a whole, I've always had good experiences in B-Sides. Me too. Um, yeah. But it, this, this sort of touches on something else, right? Inclusivity feeds into security. Okay, talk to me. If, if someone doesn't feel safe to be themselves in a community, um, to, to put on my sort of deeper infosec hat, right, part of, uh, as I understand, going for clearance is making sure there's no compromise, things like that. So if people ha need to feel safe emotionally to contribute, lest someone be able to push them out or apply leverage or scare them in some way. And so from that, from that angle specifically, inclusivity is a security issue. From another right. one, it's a sustainability issue. You're talking about wanting to have diverse communities, but to do that, we have to have people who contribute to open source, pick up the, you know, the ax, the bucket of water, chop wood, carry water, that analogy, and then stay around for a long time mm -hmm. and then teach the next generation. Yeah. That's about sustainability, especially in our security projects in open source. We have to encourage that. Yeah. I mean, it I, I wasn't that long ago we were reading about, you know, harassment and so forth, at, mm -hmm. at, uh, worse than harassment, mm -hmm. even, attacks mm -hmm. at, at some infosex shows. So I, I don't want to give a false impression. We, we've made progress. We as have. I, but as we have I more to go. Here and look back. Yeah. Just the, yes, there's, there's more to be done. One other quick point on, yeah. on the diversity thing, and then I want to get a little technical. Um, look, you are who you are, and you've been doing this a long time. <laughs> I am who I am. I've been doing this a long time. It's very different when you're 22 years old, coming out of school, and you're dealing with life in, yeah. in its entirety, and you are either non-binary or... You know, there's something else, you know, yep. you're a person of color, whatever, you're coming into this industry, right? And, I mean, people could look at you and say, they're a, a role model. I did it. I could, I could I hope. Did good, that job, right. good job, good job. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I, uh, I, they're I, I, a role I'm model. I'm so honored that people Yeah, no, that. I mean, but, but that's the truth, right? 
but they look at you and say, well, there, they've been around a long time. They, they may not know the bumps and bruises along the way to get to where you are today. Right? And they may not understand. Yeah. Well, hopefully it's easier for them, right? Because well. there have been trailblazers who, who kind of did this. But what talk to people coming into our communities now, whether it be InfoSec or open source or just technology in general, what advice do you give to, to non-binary, other underrepresented communities here? Do you just damn the torpedoes full speed ahead? Mm -hmm. or, you know, what, what's the right advice? I don't know that there is any one right answer, or certainly not a one-size-fits-all answer, but um, to anyone non-binary, trans, gender non-conforming, other minorities coming into InfoSec or open source, I'd say find your people, stick together, um, and find supportive communities, work in them, help grow them, help pass on that knowledge and make safety for others. And communities that become more welcoming will thrive. Those that are not welcoming will not thrive. And that's part of the nature of open source. Um. I love it. All right. We probably <laughs> took a lot of time more than we wanted to, but we still have more time. Let's talk a bit now. So you're doing another session. I thought you said it was tomorrow afternoon. Yes, tomorrow afternoon. Uh, I'm giving a talk on Gitbomb. Uh, which is a terrible name. People should never let me name open source projects. You uh, named this one? I named this one. Uh, I'm one of the, the, the two co-founders. Um, it is, so we've, we've repurposed part of Git. It's a version control system, but under the hood, it's actually a blockchain, believe it or not. Okay. Um, it's a Merkle tree. And so we've repurposed part of that to handle software supply chain security in a particular way that others aren't doing yet. And this is complementary to SBOM, Software Bill of Materials. Right. It's complementary to software signing projects like SIGStore. Mm -hmm. It's complementary to uh, build integrity, sort of build observation like in Toto. It solves a different problem, and that is, how do I know what's in this package? What's in this tin? Um, I like the analogy of a can of soup. And say, oh, it's Campbell's chicken noodle soup. You kind of know what it is and if you want to buy it. Right. If you have allergies, you can look at the back and say, well, does it contain these allergens? But that's not enough information to, uh, for a recall. If you buy soup and there happens to be a recall, the store could actually call you up and say, hey, that can of soup, does it have this 10-digit you know, number, number stamped on the bottom of it? Um, because they know how to trace back from the factory or the farm that it came from when there's a salmonella outbreak or something, mm -hmm. all the way through the supply chain to the store to who bought it. I want to enable that kind of artifact resolution across the supply chain in open source at zero cost to developers and projects. I want it to be automatic in our build tools for every small project out there that doesn't have a budget to buy, run big infrastructure, so that everyone who's consuming open source software has more ability to trust what's in it. This doesn't solve security problems, but it helps people discover later on, after it's been built and downloaded and being run in production, if there's a known vulnerability somewhere deep in the dependency chain, like Log4j. Two, two things. Yeah. So first of all, I had a very interesting conversation with my friend Chen Si Wang at RSA last a couple of weeks ago around S bombs specifically, mm -hmm. but around this whole idea now of starting to kind of really delve into the ingredients, if you will. Yeah. And and you know Chen Si Chen Si smart smart woman, she she brought up a uh, interesting point, which is this isn't soup. This is software. Mm -hmm. And if I start giving you the recipe for my software, mm -hmm. what's to stop you from spinning up your own version of it? And if it's open source, well, that's fine. You're, right, you're allowed right. to do that. But if it's not open source, will, will proprietary software folks yep. be willing to play when they realize that they're giving out their recipes? So that's a totally great point and one we have taken into consideration. Mm -hmm. um, the Gitbomb project doesn't give out the recipe. It's just giving out the, the fingerprint, the little barcode of things, not the details of how right. you made it or put it together. And for commercial software, um, because it's a, it's a Merkle tree, it's a tree structure, 
a vendor who's combining open source and proprietary software can choose to selectively truncate the tree, distribute the rest of the tree with a stub there that you can then reattach under NDA if a customer asks. Got it. I love it. Now, um, next question on mm -hmm. this area that I want to explore is, what's the, is the goal here to be potentially to get, like you mentioned, artifacts, get like maybe JFrog Artifactory to include it with all of their artifacts in, in, their, in their repo? Or, or maybe in the Nexus, or not Nexus, uh, Nexus, Nexus Sony for, type. For MITRE. Or MITRE even too, yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, is, is that kind of where this heads? This or? is where it could go, yeah. Um, in the Gitbomb project, it's open source. I'm not focusing on any of the commercialization of this, but I can see ways where companies like those or SNCC, who just joined the project, sure. could totally commercialize on this or build capabilities into their scanning tools. Um, so that's possible, that it would, and, and I think enabling that isn't our primary goal, but it's certainly secondary and we're taking it into account. Okay. I also just want to be clear that um, Gitbomb is not part of open OSSF or Linux at this point. Correct, at this point in time. Um, but that's also a normal part of the process of the OpenSSF. Projects usually spin up in kind of a, an, a neutral, non-affiliated space. And then when they have a community around them, they reach a certain maturity level, then they might apply to join a foundation like the OpenSSF and go through a review process. Um, and so if I speak from my, my role on the OpenSSF Technical Advisory Committee right now, I'm actually helping to define that process for project intake um, in a way so that supports everybody. Will, will there be sort of a a defined thing, sort mm -hmm. of like you have in CNCF with exactly. sandbox, yep. incubation, all yep. the way through to graduation. We are working on that right now. We have a proposal getting ready to share from the TAC to the governing board pretty soon uh, that, that defines all that. It's, it's analogous to the CNCF, but not exactly the same because we are a different foundation Absolutely. with different needs. I think I have your own thing. All right. Um, last thing. Yep. For people who are more, want more information around Gitbomb, where can they go? gitbomb.dev. Yep, that's easy. And yep. it, I assume it's probably on GitHub too? Uh, it's on, up on GitHub. We have a, a GitHub org. I think, I think it's git-bomb on GitHub and just gitbomb, G-I-T-B-O-M dot dev or tune into my talk uh, Tuesday afternoon. And you can do that even if you're not here in Austin. Again, as I said in the beginning, if you missed it, it is available as a virtual event. Well, Ava, this was probably the longest 15-minute interview <laughs> you've ever done. <laughs> But yeah, I want to thank you. For, well, fun. we had a lot to cover. Yeah, we had a yeah. lot to cover. I want to thank you. Thank you for all you do. Not not just for being on our show, but for all you're doing for communities around open source and elsewhere, as well as the security work. Thanks so much for having me, Alan. My pleasure.